Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, this webinar will be the last of the year in CTE's Leadership Circle webinar series. Uh, this is the Striking the Balance and Aligning Zero Emission Trucks and Infrastructure Deployment. I will be the moderator today. My name is Sonia Bagat. I'm an engineering consultant at CTE and the market lead for Ground Freight. A couple of housekeeping notes for today. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sharing the recording afterwards. Uh, and please send all your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll have a moderated question and answer session at the end of all of the presentations. So CTE is a membership-based organization and we'd like to extend a big thank you to all our members and their participation on this webinar today. CT is a nonprofit organization, and we have 30 years of experience in zero emission vehicle and infrastructure planning and deployment projects across the United States. Uh, we have seven different priority markets, and today's discussion is going to be surrounding the ground freight and heavy duty trucks market. So since 2016, CTE has worked on a variety of zero emission, medium duty and heavy duty deployment projects with a variety of fleet operators. And our discussion today is going to center around the theme of balancing vehicle and infrastructure deployments. A major lesson that we've learned from our project partners over the years has been um, surrounding the importance of the market to grow together. Uh, we learn different insights from our project partners. We tend to hear from fleet operators the importance of total cost of ownership and the availability of fueling and charging solutions, as well as availability of truck options. Uh, from truck manufacturers, they uh, want to sell their zero emission vehicles, but when they talk to clients, uh, there's a need for, again, fueling and charging options within those regions. And from station developers, uh, they tend to need some sort of demand or offtake guarantee before they can invest in some of these big projects. And so to hear more on these projects, uh, on these topics, we'll hear from our panelists today. Uh, so Dr. Ben Hapek is a senior manager at Hyundai TransLead and in charge of the U.S. business development for eco-friendly commercial vehicles. He's focusing on introducing the Exeunt fuel cell truck to the U.S. market. Uh, Steve Boyer is the commercial vice president for Hyzon Motors. He has worked in the automotive and heavy duty trucks industries over his 30 year career. Bill Zobel serves as the Director of Alternative Fuel Strategy and Business Development for Pilot. He is responsible for the development and execution of the company's alternative fuel strategy. And Tony Williamson is the Director of Compliance and Sustainability at TTSI. He is responsible for fleets acquisitions and management while promoting a cleaner environment through alternative fuel vehicles and policy. So without further ado, we'll start by hearing from Ben. Thank you, Sonia, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, my name is Benjamin Hapek here at Hyundai Translead, in charge of uh, US business development to bring our fuel cell heavy duty truck Exient to the market. And I'm happy to provide you first with a little bit of background on myself. So please skip ahead here. Go ahead. Um, started my um, automotive career. Uh, at Daimler, actually, in, in R&D, before moving to Hyundai in 2015 uh, to the development center, uh, R&D center in Korea, initially working on powertrain development before transitioning to heavy-duty truck development. And I was working uh, with customers and partners uh, for our first deployments in Switzerland, which will also I'll highlight here a little bit later. Then in 2020, I moved to our headquarters in Seoul for fuel cell truck business development with focus on the US market. And earlier this year, since January, I'm here uh, in San Diego at Hyundai Translead to work locally on fuel cell truck business development. Um, next slide, please. A, a short intro of Hyundai. We are um, top three OAM worldwide together with Kia, um, number five in the US. 
uh, originally founded in 1967. Everybody, I think, knows us for our cars, but we actually also do commercial trucks. Not yet in the U.S. Besides our uh, early demonstration programs that we do, um, so we hope that we can also be known in the future for our commercial vehicle product. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, fuel cell uh, vehicle development, uh, that reaches back to um, 1998, where we initiated uh, at Hyundai our fuel cell truck uh, or fuel cell system development program. The first prototype, uh, the Santa Fe fuel cell in 2000. Uh, and a world's first, couple of world's first, actually, the world's first zero produced FCEV, which was the Tucson fuel cell back in 2013. Then um, introducing in 2018 Nexo, the world's best selling FCEV with more than 45,000 vehicles on the road in Korea alone. And 2020, then marking the world's first fuel cell heavy duty truck, the Exeunt, uh, produced and introduced to the market. We have in Korea also since 2020 zero produced buses on the street um, since 2020 and 2023 then marked uh, our fuel cell coach bus, the universe, and also the long haul tractor, the Exeunt for the US market specifically. Next slide, please. So on the technology side, I'm giving, I'm starting with, with Switzerland because this is where we actually did what, what this workshop is all about, matching trucks with infrastructure. So next next slide, please. Here we have 49 trucks on the road since 2020. We logged in over 5 million miles with our customers. So we show that the technology works and is reliable. We have 20, 23 customers that are actually using the truck. Um, and we are very happy with the results so far. So the systems last longer, the fuel cell systems last longer than expected or that we calculated with. And customers are extremely happy with the low noise and vibration of the trucks. And there are also no breakdowns, no field breakdowns or any quality issues. So, so far we are very satisfied uh, as are our customers. So on the refueling side, next slide, please. Um, we show here that you need to basically cover a full ecosystem from energy and hydrogen generation to transport of hydrogen down to the truck OEM and infrastructure provider. And down you see here an, an example of what that looks like. Next slide, please. So in the Swiss case, we have uh, 16 hydrogen refueling stations uh, with our partner HydroSpider um, and other uh, fuel station operators such as Avia that you can see here, basically covering the whole of Switzerland um, with refueling stations. So um, 16 are online right now. And at this, uh, Hydropower plant that you can see here, uh, we produce 300 metric tons of hydrogen per year with our partners of HydroSpider that are then put into these containers. The containers are brought to the refueling stations. We do a drop and swap with the empty container, bring that back to the, um, to this, uh, to the production facility to uh, recharge it with, with, with newly produced hydrogen. So this is... And uh, an uh, example case that I wanted to bring out of Switzerland, I know we talked uh, about the US today, so um, please uh, move ahead. Next slide. So in the US, uh, our first market entry, so to say, is the Norcal Zero project um, in uh, domiciled at the port of Oakland. Next slide. Here we have the, sing the largest single deployment of fuel cell electric trucks in North America to date. 30 vehicles have been delivered and are in service since July, 2023. Um, they are being served by um, a heavy duty hydrogen refueling station uh, that is uh, equipped with four tons of liquid hydrogen storage on site has been or is being built right now by First Element Fuel that is capable to serve up to 60 trucks per day um, and is also able to fuel light duty vehicles at 700 bar. Is co located uh, with the port of Oakland at the site host is EBMAT, the East Bay Municipality Utility District. So, right now we are serving um, with our fleet operator Globus uh, five customers out of the port and are currently expanding our business. You can see here the, the structure. So, the whole project is being managed by, by CTE, and we have partners for uh, hydrogen refueling infrastructure with FEF and service with Pape Kenworth. Since this is a government funding project, um, the chicken and egg problem got served quite quite easily. Uh, the trucks and the refueling station are being deployed at the same time. And I think this is exactly what you have to do if you 
if you have trucks without fuel, they can't operate. And if you have a refueling station uh, without having trucks uh, off taking hydrogen, uh, a business case can never work. So this program is nice because both come at the same time, which is which is which is a perfect scenario. Next slide. So talking about the product or the truck itself, this is just for your information here. It is uh, a cab over engine European style vehicle that has been uh, basically the uh, tried and true Swiss vehicle uh, repurposed for the US market. In Switzerland, we have it as a straight truck. Here in the US, we have it as a tractor, basically being able to, to tow any standard trailer uh, or whatever you have here. We use uh, an e-motor with 350 kilowatt uh, maximum output, two fuel cell systems at 90 kilowatts, so 180 kilowatt total stack power, and a 72 kilowatt battery. The overall capacity of the tanks is 68 kilogram usable, and this translates into a, a usable range of about 450 miles. And we demonstrate that with our fleet uh, operators, so depending on duty cycle and uh, payload, for between 400 and two, up to 500 miles, depending on the on the duty cycle, uh, with the with the target to be refueled in, in just 30 minutes. Next slide, please. So here are a few uh, highlights of the uh, of the Norkel project as we have it right now. So here are all of our 30 trucks being lined up as they are now all deployed in in the US, and um, our fleet operator GT Freight secured five customers, um, mostly of out of the um, uh, merchant shippers and container shippers that are operating uh, in and around the port of Oakland with five routes, uh, for example, shuttle moves internally, terminal to rail, but also routes uh, uh, to Lethrop, which is about a 130 mile round trip, and then other routes from Oakland to Hayward, Richmond and Stockton, so very regional, regional, regional routes. Um, and GET Freight is also now in advanced talks with six other customers who are interested to run these these vehicles in the area because they see it works and uh, it's 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 a it's a very good fit. Um, the station right now, the hydrogen refueling station, is still in the commissioning phase. Um, we operate all thirty trucks in rotation until it is really completely built, and we are currently relying on a mobile refueler that is provided by our refueling partner FEF. That is shown on the next slide, please. So here you can see the site, uh, the hydrogen refueling station as of October 28th, so a little bit old already, a month old, but um, you can see that all of the equipment is basically already on site uh, and ready. And we are starting test fueling now and uh, the trucks have been basically being kept on the road uh, by a mobile refueler that you can see here on the right side. Next slide. Um, the bit important to mention is that with one, with 15 hydrogen fuel cell trucks, you have the same hydrogen offtake, like 700 uh, uh, passenger cars showing how, how important it is to bring these trucks because they are really key enabler for, for a hydrogen refueling business case. And lastly, I'd like to very quickly give a few comments on hydrogen hubs. So please uh, jump ahead two slides for future opportunities. So we believe that hydrogen hubs, uh, the $7 billion investment by, by DOE, and another billion for stimulating the demand side will be a real game changer. And we will see for the first time actual implement implementations of a hydrogen based economy throughout the United States and various regions that would also, also include uh, heavy duty trucking. And we believe that a close alignment between truck OEMs and hydrogen refueling station builders and operators is necessary to avoid underutilized refueling stations or trucks that cannot be supported with fuel. But overall, this is a very positive sign, and we are really looking forward to, to this hydrogen, hydrogen future in the US. So with that, I think I stayed roughly within the time limit. And thank you. Hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Boyer. Um, I am the Vice President of Commercial for Hyzon, responsible for uh, getting uh, all of our fuel cells out into out into the world. And uh, one of the biggest use cases we're seeing uh, for opportunities is heavy duty trucking. Next, next slide, please. So Hyzon is a, is a fuel cell company. So we build and design uh, fuel cells. Uh, we are working to around the world to integrate those fuel cells into various 
uh, opportunities from a use case. Uh, in the U.S., we're using currently using a Freightliner Cascadia chassis um, to to integrate. In in Europe, we're using a DOF chassis, and then in uh, Australia, we have just deployed our first uh, uh, Iconic Mercedes Iconic refuse vehicle. Um, so we're integrating it to various. We are we are rel we are uh, OEM agnostic on on how our fuel cell gets used, and we are utilizing these for some of our initial uh, opportunities. Next slide. Hazon's a global organization. Uh, we have our, our headquarters in Bolingbrook, Illinois. That's where we do our manufacturing of fuel cells. Um, we have uh, test labs in Troy, Michigan, and Rochester, New York as well. Uh, the European organization is based in the Netherlands. Uh, and Melbourne is where the Australian uh, operation is based. And we also have uh, an engineering office in China from a development standpoint. Next slide, please. So the biggest thing from our with our trucks and, and what we're trying to do is, is to make sure that you have a zero emission vehicle with no compromise in how you use your truck and how you use your truck each day. Uh, next slide. So we are um, the basic fuel cell operation is uh, is shown here and I, and I won't go into how how it works, but uh, our magic is in our membrane electrode assembly, the MEA that we design and develop in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Um, and that's what goes into the fuel cell stack. So, um, you know, uh, that is how the hydrogen um, gets uh, gets transformed from just hydrogen into electricity, water, and uh, and heat. So that's what gets used to to power the vehicle. Next slide. The basics of uh, fuel cell versus battery electric. They both have their use cases. And but for Class Eight trucks, what we're seeing as as good opportunities is is the biggest thing is from a from a weight standpoint, a fuel cell vehicle will typically be much lighter. Uh, ours, ours, we've seen anywhere from three thousand to ten thousand pounds less than the, than the uh, than a battery electric. Uh, range tends to be a little bit longer, um, and I know Ben just talked about that a little bit. We're in the same in the same kind of range uh, aspect. Fueling time is significantly better. Twenty to thirty minutes is is an expected fueling time, which is not a whole lot different than what people see on on diesel. Um, and that helps for a lot of fleets that do slip seating um, and things like that. So from a, from an operational standpoint, it works much better. Um, and then cold weather performance. So because a fuel cell creates its own heat, um, it is definitely a big part of uh, being, operate, being able to operate in the cold. Um, so from either from heating the cab or from even from heating, using that heat to heat the cab and heat the driver, um, but also to, uh, to heat and warm up the batteries. So um it is, uh, you know, the, the trucks are a little bit more expensive at this point in the development cycle, but we do expect that to reduce um, as production gets added and, and as we increase capabilities. Next slide, please. So Hyzon does its own fuel cell production. Um, we design and develop it in-house. This is a, a picture of our MEA process, and this is uh, how we produce the MEA. Um, we are developing a 200 kilowatt single stack system. Um, that is on that is set for starter production here in the middle of uh, 2024. Next slide. So our 200 kilowatt system is based on all of our proprietary fuel cell technology, and that's all developed by our engineering teams um, around the world. Um, we have 157 patents protecting our our fuel cell, and uh, we believe from a technology standpoint, it's it's uh, one of the best fuel cells you can you can find, and it will be one of the most powerful and most efficient. Next slide. The biggest thing and the biggest reason why we developed a 200 kilowatt single stack is uh, so we, you know, from a from a vehicle standpoint, um, having only one fuel cell in the vehicle reduces the packaging um, and reduces the pa packaging needs. So it's about 30 percent less volume and it's also significantly less weight. Um, so having one fuel cell versus two is about 500 pounds less weight um, into the vehicle, which uh, obviously when you're hauling freight and getting paid to haul freight, that's an important part. Next slide. We have tested throughout the last year and a half. Um, we've tested in various environments in various places. Um, we've completed uh, 18 trials, um, run thousands of miles in various places. Uh, we complete, just completed a trial in Alberta, a long-term trial up in Alberta where we got down to uh, 25 below Fahrenheit um, and the truck ran quite well. Um, we've also tested in Texas in temperatures 100 to 110 degrees. 
Um, so went through a lot of uh, environmental testing, real, real world hauling freight. Um, we also have done a lot of testing from an environmental chamber standpoint and went uh, above and below those numbers. But having it out in the real world is a big part of uh, of what we're trying to do. Next slide. We are just starting to deploy some of our first trucks um, into the U.S. So uh, approved warehousing and or approved transportation and warehousing. Uh, the, the were the first delivery of a 110 kilowatt uh, fuel cell in in early November, and we ex we are delivering uh, trucks to Performance Food Group as well as a couple of more trucks into the into the port of LA to customers uh, in December. So looking forward to both of those deliveries. And when we're talking about fuel on those, you know, it's it is a challenge, and and kind of like Ben was mentioning, most of the fueling right now is done in behind the fence mobile trailer kind of applications. And, and that's what we're looking for right now with these customers. Um, and as we expand, we'll we'll have additional options going forward. Next slide. Our 200 kilowatt development has, uh, is, is, on, is on plan. Uh, we've completed B sample testing. C samples will comp be completed by the end of this year and start of production is planned for the middle of the year. Our capacity for this is, and what we're expecting as we move forward is to be able to build 700, 200 kilowatt fuel cells per year. Um, and those will primarily go into these applications. Next slide. So we talked about this a little bit from a challenge standpoint. The challenge is definitely fueling and um, and what we're looking at right now and, and what we're trying to develop. People have, you know, people want clean, people want local. The more local it is, the more, the, the less your transportation cost is to get that fuel to you. And that really helps from a cost standpoint. And then they want scalable. Most folks that we, most fleets that we talk to are starting with a, a low number of trucks, can be three or five. And, um, and, and they only need a limited amount of fuel for that. So a lot of the mobile refuelers uh, work well in those sorts of situations as, as things start to scale. Next slide. So what we see now and, and from the market, and, and we see this changing quite a bit, um, you know, current costs are 24 to 30 to, you know, 36 kilograms at various stations on the light duty side. Um, but we're seeing a lot of production potential and, and new facilities coming online in the next 12 to 18 months. So where it is right now is not where it's going to be in the very near future. And we see fuel costs, fuel costs being cut by a significant amount going forward and starting to get to where you can get to TCO, a total cost of ownership of the vehicle parity to diesel, you know, in the next couple of years. And then like, like we met, like uh, Ben mentioned, as these hydrogen hubs come online, we expect significant cuts going forward as well, um, where you're going to see a lot more production, um, a lot more investment into the, into the area, uh, a lot more investment into hydrogen and uh, and significantly less on the fuel costs where you really get to a TCO advantage over diesel. Um, so we really expect that that's going to happen here in the next couple of years. Next slide. Um, ben kind of already went through this, so uh, so so we'll go, we'll keep going, but uh, this is uh, this is a big part of how we expect to reduce the fuel costs and, and get to that total cost of ownership reduction. And that is all. Thank you all very much. Look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ben. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Bill Zobel. I'm with the Pilot Company, and I serve as the Director of Alternative Fuels for Pilot, focused primarily on hydrogen at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So Pilot is the largest operator of travel centers in the United States. Uh, for those that travel the highways and byways of the U.S., you've probably seen one of our many brands that we have out there. Uh, over 850 locations uh, in the U.S. and Canada, and we operate through a variety of different brands. We serve over 70,000 trucking fleet customers every single day. That's quite a bit. We serve about 14 billion gallons of diesel fuel into the U.S. market and are the largest provider of diesel fuel in the U.S. today. Um, our team of over 28,000 people throughout the U.S. Serves, serves over a million guests every single day. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows what our reach is, sort of where we are. It's a little bit dated. We've added a few more dots to the map here than what, what you see in front of you, but you can see that we have quite a bit of coverage across the U.S. to help support the deployment of um, alternative technologies, alternative uh, fuel technologies across the spectrum, both electric and, and hydrogen, with today's focus being on, on hydrogen. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the value chain. 
All right. How does how does all this come together? Um, both Ben and Steve provided a nice overview of, of the fuel cell tractors, what their capabilities are, range, refueling speed, and so forth. Um, all of this, though, has to come together to make that work. Uh, the first piece of this is hydrogen supply. Um, there are all, as it, both private presenters have talked about, the hydrogen hubs that the federal government <clears throat> is supporting are going to help deploy additional hydrogen supply into the marketplace. And we expect the cost of that supply will come down considerably over time. I've listed some considerations there uh, for folks to think about when you're thinking about hydrogen supply, how to buy it, if you're gonna build it, what you wanna think about in building it and so forth. In terms of logistics and transport, that's an, also an important piece of the market. Uh, Pilot does not see that there is going to be infrastructure developed to, to deliver hydrogen by pipeline to retail fueling stations. There's just too much of that that has to happen and too much distance to cover. Uh, we see that the hydrogen will be transported by truck, either as a gaseous or a liquid product. There are a variety of different ways to do that. We're active in that market today. We transport both gaseous product and liquid product for a variety of, of hydrogen and use customers across the US today. And that's an exciting and, and growing piece of the market. Retail refueling infrastructure, and this is the piece I'm going to spend a little bit more time on on the next slide, but there are different ways to do this. Uh, you can store your product on site as a gas or a liquid to deliver that product to your customers. Today's trucks are uh, store onboard gaseous hydrogen. Uh, there is a school of thought that this may go to onboard liquid hydrogen over time. We'll see how that develops. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I said, about the stations earlier, but some things to think about when you're looking at hydrogen refueling stations uh, is first of all, how you're going to store your product. And that would be based on what you expect to be your demand profile. What kind of fill speed do you want for your trucks and how long do you want them to dwell in the lane? The footprint that it's going to take up on your site, traffic flow and resupply. Uh, there are permitting considerations um, across the board, federal, state, and local that need to be uh, considered. Uh, how you're going to operate your site. And importantly, and this is something that Pilot is very, very highly focused on, is reliability. Uh, in the commercial space, which is our focus in the hydrogen market currently, but if we're going to serve hydrogen to commercial customers, these stations have to be up and operating every single time a customer shows up at that station. The first time a customer who's trialing out a hydrogen truck comes into the station and it's not working, they're thinking this just doesn't work. So we are putting an awful lot of emphasis into the reliability of our stations. In fact, we're actually building two stations in one for the original stations that we're going to deploy uh, to ensure that we have additional resiliency and, and reliability for our customers. Uh, the last piece, which I won't touch on, Ben and Steve have already covered this, are the considerations associated with the truck and the customer. So we'll, we'll skip that box for today. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the station itself. Um, on the right side of the slide, there's just a high level uh, schematic of what one of these stations might look like. Um, the large circle down there on the bottom left, that's the hydrogen storage vessel. Uh, this one's about 4,000 pounds, 4,000 kilograms of hydrogen storage. You can see, as I touched on, we've had a two pump design. So we have some redundancy in the deliverability of the hydrogen to the refueling lanes, which are, which are shown there on the right. Uh, our stations that we will initially deploy, and we are deploying two in California today. Those are in the process of being permitted and designed. Um, we'll have two hydrogen lanes. Uh, we would like to integrate these directly into the fueling lanes for the, the pilot travel centers. In other words, not have them off in the North 40 somewhere where drivers have to go somewhere else on the site to refuel, but actually integrate them into the diesel refueling operation. So drivers are familiar um, with where they go today. They'll be going to that same place tomorrow and we'll get a, a, a very rapid refueling experience with hydrogen. I've listed some of the specifications of the system on the left here. Uh, Pilot is focused on the liquid hydrogen system, liquid on-site storage. The reason for that is as we expect larger throughputs of these sites. Uh, ben showed a diagram, to, uh, a caption earlier that showed, uh, you know, trucks will consume a lot more fuel than passenger vehicles. So we wanna make sure that we have adequate capacity at these stations. And we've designed this uh, with a four ton on-site storage uh, and and with liquid storage, uh, liquid hydrogen storage. Uh, our stations will deliver either 350 or 700 bar hydrogen to the tractors. Uh, we'll have about four and a half tons on site. And as I touched on, we'll have two fueling lanes, each with its own dispenser. Our dispensing rate currently is somewhere around 250 kilograms per hour. 
Um, those are the systems that we're looking at today. We've seen some manufacturers that are looking at systems that will increase that fill rate, uh, or that delivery rate, I should say. But those are the delivery rates that we're, we're looking at for the initial stations that we're going to put in. Now, if you take that delivery rate and sort of multiply it out by 24 hours a day in two lanes, you get about 12,000 kilograms a day of what I'll call, quote unquote, nameplate capacity. Uh, we don't expect that's actually going to be the operation of the site. We don't have trucks perfectly lined up behind each other one after another. What we actually expect is trucks will consume somewhere in the 35 to 50, maybe a kilogram per fill when they pull into the station. Um, all the data we have today on diesel trucks show that these trucks spend about anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes in the lane. So with that in mind, if we're doing four to five heavy duty trucks an hour, uh, the station is capable of serving about 120 to 160 trucks per day. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, just a quick illustration on what it takes to put one of these together. Um, and I've used a California example here because that's where we're active today. And, and the reason for that is there are grants available in California, which I've listed here in the upper left as something that needs to be considered. There's the, a new heavy duty HRI or capacity credit program that's going to be part of the amendments coming forth in the low carbon fuel standard. And it's gonna be important in California that we get those two things taken care of before we move to FID or final uh, investment decision. Once we have all that in place, we can make our equipment selection in FID. And if you drop down to the bottom of the slide, you can see that the equipment lead time today is about 12 to 14 months, that's a long time. So that's one of the one of the drivers, the long-term drivers of the timeline for station development. Uh, from there, we move into the EPC and commissioning certification process that takes about 18 months all in. And that includes the balance of any design and permitting that hasn't been done prior to FID, construction and commissioning, which takes about six months, and then any certifications that you have to do with the state to, uh, to be able to sell that fuel. And then we hop into commercial operations um, at the end of all that process. Next slide, please. Um, this is a rendering of one of the sites that we'll be putting together. This particular location has a par uh, is a long, thin parcel, and we've got two acres down at the end of it. So this one is not integrated into the diesel islands, but it's a it's a standalone two lane facility for liquid hydrogen refueling. Um, this mimics the the uh, site schematic that you saw in the previous slide, where you've got your two lanes in this diagram off to the right. You've got your um, hydrogen recharge or your, your refueling truck that comes in to refuel the on, on-site storage tank on the left. And we have the ability to add two additional lanes there on the left if we needed to, to double the capacity of that facility. So this is effectively what, what we think these are going to look like going forward if you have a liquid uh, on-site storage design. And I think that's it for me. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share our experience and knowledge of zero emission uh, vehicles. I will be uh, presenting from the end user perspective. Next. TTSI, we're headquarters in Long Beach, California. We're a third party logistics company. We started in 1989 as a air freight and then incorporated in 1997 uh, warehousing, which expand to our current uh, operations today. Today, our companies consist of 12 operating companies with a nationwide footprint. We operate in every major port in the United States, including the rail yards. Um, our service uh, consists of drainage, warehousing, transportation, which is over the road, regional hall, dedicated and specialized logistics, as well as brokerage. As far as power, we have over 800 units that we either own or lease. We have over uh, 2,300 chassis, and we have over 3,100 trailers in our network. Next slide. TTSI, we are committed to the, um, leaving the smallest footprint possible in the environment. As the um, last paragraph, our goal is to operate a zero emission fleet that service our customers while being stewards of the environment. And as you'll see through our my presentation, we'll see that we are aiding that commitment. Next slide. <clears throat> in uh, August 20, uh, 2007, 
the ports of LA and Long Beach initiated the Clean Air Action Plan. Uh, I say August um, 2007 because uh, the picture to the right is our late former co-founder and CEO Vic LaRosa announcing that TTSI will clean its fleets. Next slide. January 2008, we had purchased over 106 clean diesels and put those in operation. By May 2008, we purchased another eight um, LNG trucks, which was one of the first in the port complex to operate in the drayage capacity. Next slide. By 2011, we were up to 57 LNG trucks that was running in drayage and regional hall in the um, Southern California. Next slide. In July 2011, TTSI took possession of the first class eight hydrogen fuel cell truck. We were told this was the first truck hydrogen fuel cell to be in a drainage application in the world. Next slide. In 2015, we started demonstrating battery electric trucks. We had two trucks that we ran in our operation. Next. Since 2008, we have demonstrated the following types of all class A alternative fuel cell trucks. I mean, alternative fuel trucks, 16 battery electric trucks, 14 hydrogen fuel cell trucks, six 12 liter common CNG low NOx, the prototype engine, and 10 of the nine liter Cummins LNG CNG hybrid trucks. Next. These are pictures of the uh, battery electric trucks that we demonstrated since 2015. Next. Here's another picture of the Cascadia battery electric truck. This here is a picture of the Nikola battery electric truck. Next. And this right here is the experience that we have uh, gathered from the battery electric trucks. You see the positive, of course, zero uh, greenhouse gas emission, no idling, low noise pollution, um, the torque, uh, no issues with torque. And uh, the last driver acceptance. Um, <clears throat> now, if you look to the right, you can see our concerns. Purchase cost is two to three times the diesel. And that includes with the um, subsidies. Uh, the tractor weight is anywhere from a fourth to a third the weight, uh, additional weight for a conventional diesel truck. Charge time can be an issue. Infrastructure costs to bring in uh, electricity to your, your terminal is a, is a can hamper. And then availability of the infrastructure in that area. Battery life, of course, duty cycle, cost to insure, and then also the cost to re service and repair. Next. So these here are pictures of the hydrogen fuel cell trucks we have demonstrated. Next. 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 And this is what we gathered from um, demonstrating the hydrogen fuel cell. Of course, the positive is still the same as the battery electric, but if you look down at the bottom, the last one is duty cycle. This was a uh, concern on the battery electric, but for as the hydrogen fuel cell duty cycle for us that we have found out is a positive. Then of course the concerns are still the same as uh, the battery electric cost, tear weight, fuel infrastructure, battery life, cost to insure, and cost to service and repair. Next. <clears throat> so during the demonstration of the hydrogen fuel cell uh, trucks, we had our own hydrogen, mobile hydrogen fuel cell um, uh, stations on site. The picture on the top left, that is from our San Pedro location. And the picture at the bottom right, that is our Carson facility, both in Southern California. Next picture. As for battery electric, we had to get creative. Um, like I said before, with the battery electric, bringing on site um, infrastructure to charge the trucks. Uh, so we had to get creative. Um, we brought in a gas generator, um, gas, <clears throat> excuse me, gas generator run by CNG, which was uh, new, renewable CNG. We had two chargers and uh, we ran um, those two chargers on 10 trucks. 
Next. This is our current fleet here in Southern California. Uh, we have 10 Nikola battery electric trucks in operation now. Um, in our um, New York, New Jersey operation, we have 10 ORGVs that's running the um, moving warehouse. Uh, in CNG, we have a total of um, 96 CNG trucks here in Southern California. Next slide. Now, our method of deployment is going to be fairly simple, but it's going to depend on technology, demand, and cost. Um, the regulations that's going to come forth January 1, 2024 in California, we will be a compliant um, company, and we will have capacity to operate in the ports of L.A. as well as the state of California. Next. Thank you, and um, this is a cop this is uh, our website. Please review it. And if you have any questions, please contact me. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for the great uh, information today. Uh, if I can have all the panelists turn on their cameras, and we'll start with questions and answers. Great. Um, so first question for Ben, what is the truck reliability and availability compared to the vehicle, diesel vehicles replaced? Um, and can you talk a little more about what you've learned from the Exient demonstrations and what's worked well and what needs to improve with the vehicles? Yep, sure. So <clears throat> it's uh, not easy to give you a very clear answer about long-term durability since these trucks are on the road as I expressed earlier since 2020. Obviously there's a difference between a lab tests that you do with a hydrogen fuel cell system and then putting it actually in a vehicle and having it on the road. Um, that that is, that is that makes a difference. But overall we didn't see so far in our Swiss operation any breakdown related to uh, fuel, cell, fuel cell issues. And we have trucks that are now exceeding the 200,000 mile uh, to 180 to 200,000 miles driven in total in Switzerland with still the first uh, outfitted systems on board. Um, the development to have a fuel cell that is as reliable as a diesel engine, which is which is a million miles. Let's just say we are still a few years out of that, but the, uh, that there, we have a clear target and uh, uh, targets and roadmaps in, uh, in our development schedule to achieve that in a stepwise approach. So basically, Right now, we look at maybe one or two exchanges over truck lifetime uh, to keep them on the road. The same is true for battery trucks, by the way, as well. But eventually, we will have a situation where the, where the fuel cell systems might be able to survive the whole usable life of a truck, which is typically 10 years. So, I hope that, was... that answers the question. Was there something else that I missed? Or no, two that's... questions. That's good, thanks. Um, next question, I think uh, we can have it be an open question and um, start with Bill, but where does the liquid hydrogen or originate from and how is it usually transported to the stations? Can you talk more about the source of the hydrogen fuel? Sure, um, I get the short answer is it depends, right? It depends on what market you're in and you know what, what your customers are looking for. So from pilot's perspective, we're looking looking to meet the needs of our, our customers. And we have several big shippers and carriers that are looking for lower carbon solutions. So that will help drive what hydrogen we choose to put into the refueling center. Um, we're certainly not looking at moving gray into our hydrogen refueling centers, uh, but we, we are looking heavily at green and blue, depending on where we're at in the country, the availability of that supply will vary as will the, as will the price point. So it will be a matter of managing, you know, price at the, at the supply point, um, carbon content at the supply point with with what our customers are looking for and trying to pull all that together. In terms of transport, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we transport both the gaseous and liquid fuels today. We transport the liquid product, which I think was a question in these large cryogenic trailers. There's been a lot of advancements in trailer design that make the, have made the trailers lighter and allow for uh, putting in more capacity. So you have bigger drops, which lowers your, your dollar per kilogram. Um, will, I think there was a question in the chat about will these trucks be, you know, hydrogen fuel cell trucks or will they be diesel trucks? Our goal as pilot is to run hydrogen, 
uh, hydrogen trailers with hydrogen fuel cell trucks. It may take us a little bit of time to get there, but that that is the ultimate goal. Uh, I'll mention uh, liquid as well. So we did a demonstration here a couple of months ago uh, with a liquid truck, with a truck that had liquid tanks on board, and uh, we were, we got that fuel. There's there's very like like Bill mentioned. There's a few places around the country that you can get liquid. Um, and the nice thing is because you're carrying so much more in, a, in one of those cryogenic trailers, it is much cheaper to transport and, and oftentimes much uh, a little bit cheaper at the well as well. So we do see an opportunity for liquid in the future. Um, that truck ran for about 16 hours and ran 550 miles almost. Um, so it was uh, it was a really good demonstration opportunity for what the the potential ability of liquid is down the road once there's fueling standards and some opportunities there going forward. Great, thanks. Uh, I have a couple couple different questions uh, again for you, Bill. Um, we'll kind of, I think we can go through them pretty quickly, but uh, is Pilot considering light duty dispensers at the travel centers that already have heavy duty? Yes, we'd like to, we'd like to utilize the same piece of infrastructure and run a line over to the, what we call the light duty forecourt, right? We separate those two classes of customers for all, you know, very obvious reasons, right? You don't want big trucks and small cars in the same location. But um, we do believe it's possible to do that. It's a bit of an engineering challenge to get that hydrogen over there from uh, the heavy duty area, but that's something we are looking at. And then in reference to the Gantt chart that you showed, at what point do you actually purchase the equipment? Um, the decision for the equipment is made at FID, right? That that uh, final investment decision. So we'll, at that point, you put down a down payment, if you will, on the equipment. And then there are phases during the uh, uh, delivery cycle that you make additional payments on that equipment with the final payment being after commissioning and, uh, and testing of the equipment on site. Great. And then um, the question is, does Pilot know which fueling protocol it will use yet? But maybe you can start with a quick uh, context description of the SAE fueling protocols and what the difference means for uh, fuel station developers. Sure. So so there's a fueling protocol in place today called J2601. And everybody's using that. And all of the dispenser manufacturers have designed their delivery equipment to that design. There's a, a group that is working on a new protocol, 2601-5, that will increase that fueling rate up to what I'm hearing is somewhere around 20 kilograms per minute. Um, so you will have a much broader range, I believe, with 2601-5 to work with at the stations, which will, I think, enable a lot of innovation in station design, right? It'll allow for uh, faster delivery of hydrogen if you, you know, if, if you care to do that uh, and just give you more options as a provider. That 2601-5 protocol is expected to be completed by the end of 2024, which based on the timeline I showed everybody um, uh, and every all the all the dispenser manufacturers are designing to that protocol today. So they'll be ready for it when it comes out. So we should be able to have that new equipment ready to install in the 25 timeframe. Great, thank you. And then, uh... Ben and or Steve, do you want to comment on the the implications of the fueling protocols? Um, yeah, just real, real quick maybe. So um, what has to be understood is that there also has to be some redesign uh, happening on the on the truck side. Yeah? So basically all of the plumbing, all of the receptacle is uh, the obvious thing, but, but basically all of the plumbing that happens around the tanks, uh, diameters in order to keep the back pressure in check, has to be has to be adjusted as well. So, I'll just I'll just add one thing to that. I mean, I think this is a this is a part, and we've talked about this with both Steve and Ben, is that this is where the infrastructure provider has to work closely with the with the truck provider, right? Um, I mean, if if Ben and Steve go out and put this fuel cell uh, system in that can accept twenty kilograms a minute, but the customers don't really need it, right? They're have they're perfectly happy with five to ten. Then there's no reason for for folks to do that. So optimizing around what is a realistic refueling pattern for trucks. And as I mentioned earlier, somewhere in that 10 to 15 minutes, that's the amount of time these customers spend in the lane. And we've got mountains of data to show that that's how long these customers spend in these refueling lanes. So I think as long as we accommodate that as an industry, we'll probably be in pretty good shape. 
Great. Thank you guys for that discussion. Um, next question for Tony. Uh, can you elaborate on the concern with the battery life? Is the level of concern, the forecasted life different for fuel cell vehicle than for all battery electric truck? No, it's more concern for us. It's more concern. The battery life is uh, the cost of the of these trucks are, like I said before, two to three times a uh, conventional diesel truck. So we would love to see that the battery life is at least north of six years. We love to see at least six to eight years battery life. We don't want to purchase or lease a truck and we have to change out the batteries every two or three years. Now, one concern we had is when the, you know, um, all these different chargers coming out and now you got the mega chargers that can charge uh, from 20% state of charge to 90 to 100% state of charge in 20 minutes. What effect is that going to have on the batteries? You know, over a period of time. So that that's our concern. As far as the fuel cell, um, we have um, demonstrated uh, applications where there were more batteries on than there were actually for hydrogen fuel, and just the the opposite. We prefer this more hydrogen fuel on board than the battery because we would love to be able to run the hydrogen fuel cell truck as a diesel, like Bill just said. We need at least 15 to 20 minutes in the uh, fueling lane so the driver can get back on the load and deliver the goods. Right. And then the next question, uh, again, for you, Tony, is does TTSI plan to grow your hydrogen fleet? And uh, when, what, what does the timeline look like? Yes, we do plan to uh, grow um, the fuel cell. We currently have a proposal on the table for 20 fuel cell trucks that we hope to hear this month uh, and put those in operation early January, maybe second quarter uh, 2024. Um, and then from there, based off of the man, we will add to our fleet. Sounds great. Thanks. Uh, another question for uh, Hyzon and Hyundai. How do you plan for the maintenance and servicing of the fuel cell trucks? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll start with this. Um, so from a maintenance standpoint, we've uh, we've been working with a nationwide company called Emerit, um, and Emerit provides uh, maintenance services to fleets all over the country. Um, so that's one option as well. We've been working to train their uh, their technicians in areas where we're deploying our some of our first trucks, um, and and make it relatively easy for fleets to uh, to utilize them. Um, we also have opportunities and training training modules where we can train your own fleets, um, but it makes it a little bit uh, more challenging. It depends on what infrastructure you have in place from, uh, you know, from a maintenance facility and things like that. Um, and we've worked with all the other uh, large maintenance comp companies as well um, that uh, maintenance and leasing companies that uh, that are going to look to uh, eventually um, be utilizing these vehicles and, and doing the maintenance on them. So we have a variety of options. Go ahead, Ben. Very similar answer. So we're also obviously partnering up with, with specialists in the in this area. Uh, and um, in the case of the Knockout project that I des described earlier, I think I already mentioned the name. It's Pape Kenworth, which is uh, a very large um, Kenworth dealer and maintenance provider uh, located in, uh, in Oregon and Eugene. But they cover most of the Pacific Northwest and get parts of California uh, down to Bakersfield. Um, we did uh, training, technician training with them, with our overseas service team. So they have upfitted a service shop to be uh, compliant with uh, hydrogen uh, maintenance, meaning we have to in, uh, install some uh, special uh, yeah, ventilators and fans that are basically evacuating the air if there's a hydrogen leak. Uh, and of course, the, the technicians have to get the proper workforce training, uh, including uh, high voltage equipment handling and and so on and so forth. So we have that in place for, for 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 Northern California, for Southern California, where we kick off a new project um, early next year. We we have a different partner um, that will be announced at a later date, but a very similar approach, uh, training, upfitting, and so on, uh, in order to be to be qualified to do this this work on the trucks. Thank you for that. Um... So for Bill, what are the most challenging aspects of installing the hydrogen storage and fueling systems, uh, whether it's the mobile or the fixed storage? Um, let, let's let's st stick with the fixed station. Um, 
we've looked at some mobile applications, but I'll, I'll refer specifically to the fixed station. There's obviously a lot to it, right? The, what we're seeing is that fire departments are becoming more comfortable with hydrogen refueling. So the challenges there have, have become less than they were early on in the market, and that's largely due to education. We're finding that municipal governments in terms of permitting are excited about having these kinds of things in their districts, right? They want they want more of this clean refueling infrastructure in there. So we're seeing less and less pushback from them. Um, there's a categorical exemption now in, in the state of California for CEQA that allows for these stations to be built quickly without being drawn into the CEQA process, which can really extend that time frame. Uh, so on the on really on the front end, right, a lot of that uh, has been going relatively smoothly or smoother than it has been in the past. Um, we have some concerns with power, getting access to power. Just to give everybody sort of a, a level set on what the power demand is for the station that I showed you all, the two station design. Um, it's about the same power draw as a, a um, uh, EV fast charger with two 350 applications. So it's about a 750 kilowatt power draw from the grid. And that's anywhere in the U.S. That's sizable, right? That's a sizable draw. Um, so getting with the utilities early on to understand what they have available and how quickly they can get it to you is going to be going to be important. Um, in terms of getting equipment, you saw the lead time is difficult, right? We like to have lead times in the five to six months time frame. Twelve to fourteen months is a rather long lead time. That's challenging. Um, and in terms of labor to build out the station, we haven't run into any issues uh, with regard to labor. So far, that seems to be readily available for uh, all the trades that we need to put one of these together. Great. Uh, so we're almost out of time. I'll ask uh, one last quick question. Uh, keep it an open question. But do you find that shippers are requesting zero emission trucks? Uh -oh. I'll, I'll start. Um... Yes, we are finding that the shippers are beginning to uh, inquire um, the, with their um, sustainability plans, what is available to move their freight with zero emission trucks. We have talked to a number of uh, shippers over the past two to three months here in Southern California, basically because of what's going on with California come January 1st, 2024. Um, and they are beginning to uh, look at the uh, use of um, running their freight with zero emission trucks. So yes, they are aware now. Yeah, we're, we're seeing an interest as well. I'm sorry, Steve, real quick. No, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Bill. We, we've got, you know, salespeople across the country and fleets, uh, I should say fleet shippers are very interested in reducing their carbon footprint, right? They want to have, especially ones that have made commitments to their shareholders are looking for lower carbon solutions in transportation, what we'll call scope three. So I agree with Tony, it's it's coming. Yeah, I, th I think the four hire folks are, are getting questions from the people that they are shipping for. Um, and some of the private fleets then have their own sustainability efforts that they are, they're trying to work with to get uh, zero emission trucks on the road. I think I showed it in the in the presentation real quick. We have uh, five customers already. These are all, most of them are large ocean shippers. Um, six customers uh, additionally right now in the pipeline. So the interest is huge. Um, the technology, I would say, is on the truck side there. I mean, there are obvious drawbacks. Uh, Tony mentioned them, weight being, being one of it. Um, but let's be frank, compromises will need to be made in, in order to bring this to market. And uh, with with 120 years or so diesel engine development, nobody can expect that we can just flip a switch and expect everything to be working out fine right out of the gate. So this is a marathon, not a sprint. Great. Uh, so we're right about at time. Uh, thank you all so much for your participation during this webinar today. Thank you all for attending. Um, for those of you who attended, if you enjoy learning about this information today, uh, you can join CTE for one on one trucks event. We connect fleets with technology and infrastructure suppliers for direct in person dialogue around zero emission fleet transitioning um, and fleets get to attend for free. So thank you all. <laughs>